This video made possible by the ICC Stellar Surveyors and subscribers like you. Welcome back to Around the Verse, I'm Sandy Gardner. I'm Ben Lesnick. This week in the ATV interview, Jared sits down with senior network engineer Clive Johnson to discuss his work at Foundry 42 UK. And the Foundry 42 audio team talks about the sounds, sounds, and more sounds of Crusader. It's a lot of sounds. A lot of sounds. But first, we're back. Ben and I are back. It has been a month. I haven't seen you in a month. It's... I know. It feels very different and my chair feels very high. Maybe that's because you're so much taller than me. But... No, I don't care. I know. But we're back. And uh, the big news this week is that we've gone to PTU with patch 2.2.1. Uh, 221 includes a number of bug fixes and optimizations, and uh, it's looking good. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to bring that to live shortly. When Ben and I are going to have a little fly off, are we? Okay. We should. Sure. <laughs> I've been getting good in the UK because the, there's all the QA guys there, and they're actually really good at it. So. I will fly off with you anytime. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, on our live servers, players continue to explore Star Citizen Alpha 2.1, and we've seen all kinds of hijinks. Hijinks? I, I've seen people breaking the noodle machine, carrying it from place <laughs> to place. Uh, it's, it's the amount of amazing uh, emergent gameplay is just fantastic. Uh, we're, we're so excited here. It's so great to have it stable so people can play for hours and hours at a time. Um, and you know, it, it all goes to our goal of creating this living sandbox world that people can exist in. I, I think, you know, it, it's just the start of Star Citizen, but it really tells you, shows you where we're going. This week and next week, team members from around the world have all been converging here in LA for a summit to go over what's happening in development for 2016. Uh, yeah, it's fantastic. You can't uh, swing a dead cat without hitting uh, somebody from Austin or UK or Germany. <laughs> um, and Mark Skelton's here, Tony Zervek's here, uh, Pete Mackey. Everybody's here. It's great. We do love cats. <laughs> <laughs> For all those who have cats. Um, and did you know that 3D Artist Magazine has a cover story on Star Citizen this month? Yay! Yes, thanks to our own uh, Gurmak Basin. He uh, is showing off some of the techniques he used to make the Mustang shine. Um, if you are in the UK, this should be readily available. Um, and then some specialty outlets in the US, like Barnes & Noble, will uh, get this in. Uh, if it's not available today, in the next couple of days, it should be on stands. Exciting stuff. Yes. Now let's check in with studios from around the world for this week's news from around the verse. Hey everybody and welcome back to Los Angeles. I'm Eric Kyan Davis. I'm Darren Vorlick. And we've got some updates for you. Um, one of the big ones this week has been our senior tech artist, uh, Matt Intrieri, is working really, really hard on the frame rate issue with the Constellation. Mm -hmm. That we've seen some slowdowns with that ship lately and, and we think we know what it is. Um, he's working really hard on just overall evaluation as well as making some changes that we hope to get into a patch very soon. So that's a big one for us this week. Yeah, it's something that we've been doing play testing on. We've been seeing it ourselves, able to reproduce it in-house. So yeah. it, it's being addressed. Totally. Um, on the tech side, tech our engineering side, we've got our own Chad Zamzo. He is working on making missiles uh, increase in size of the hitbox to make them easier to shoot down. Now the difficulty in that is when you increase the hitbox, you have to add a geo to it, but how do you only allow projectiles to collide with that hitbox and not ships? Mm -hmm. So that's the biggest tech challenge we're facing with that right now, and he's, he's found a solution for it. Yeah. And then finally, we've got actually really cool ship update. Well, technically it's two updates. Uh, we've got Kirk working on the ESP Prowler, so it's just kind of an FYI. But the big one is, and this one's near and dear to my heart, as many viewers may know, Matt Sherman is working on the tech design of the 890 Jump. Beautiful. Oh, I can't wait for that one. Same. That's a big ship for us. I know when I uh, was first brought in on my interview, they asked me the ship I was most excited about. That's it. Same here. So I we, want my party bus. We're not only pushing on it for the production side, but also because we're passionate about that ship. So oh, yeah. It's very exciting to see Matt work on the design for that. Yep. Anything else we got for this week? That's it. Thank you again for stopping by LA. I'm Eric. I'm Beardian. See you next week. Hey guys, Jake Ross here, associate producer of the Persistent Universe, and uh, I'm here with you this week to talk a little bit about um, what we got going on here in Austin, including uh, Persistence. So Persistence 
is, is well underway, um, being worked on by our back end team here, led by Jason Ely. Um, we got Tom Sawyer and Jeffrey Zhu also working on it. Um, those guys are trucking along real nicely, and we're, we're um, starting the process of uh, completely revamping a little portion of our tech called uh, Data Store here uh, in Austin. So um, we realize that there's something about some things about Data Store that won't work well with with the way we're setting up persistence. So we're going to have to totally uh, revamp that that tech as well. Um, so uh, we've actually got Jason Ely and Jeff Zhu flying out to LA to meet up with Paul Rindell to talk a little bit about that and, and how we're going to approach that. Um, so that's that'll be uh, coming online here um, in the near future. Um, we've got a lot of people traveling. Speaking of traveling to LA, um, Tony Zurevek and Mark Skelton are out in LA right now, uh, meeting up with the guys out there and, and with Chris to, to talk about long-term planning um, for the Persistent Universe this year. Um, you know, we have 2.1 that just came out, and uh, we're aiming to get 2.2 out here pretty soon, and then 2.3 beyond that. So. Uh, we're trying to figure out what exactly we're going to have in each of those releases and, uh, and from, from the PU standpoint and Tony and Mark are, are there to make those decisions out there with Chris. Um, so we've also got people coming to Austin. Uh, Benoit um, Beausejour from Turbulent is uh, coming out here later this week um, to talk a little bit with, with John Erskine and the team uh, here in Austin on the operations side about some of the platform stuff we've got going on. So you know, specifically he, we're talking about revamping the launcher. Um, you know, kind of almost from scratch, uh, kind of revamping that thing and making it um, super robust. Uh, we're talking about um, revamping the public crash handler and, and making some adjust adjustments to that. Um, and um, the, another topic they're going to be talking about is a Dockerized platform setup. Um, so there's lots of discussions going on about not just Persistent Universe, but also on the platform operations uh, front, um, you know, different things that we've got going on to make improvements on that in that area as well throughout the year. So uh, the, month of, the month of January is a planning month, that's for sure. We we're trying to set the, uh, the ball rolling in a good direction in all, in all areas of the project, and we'll uh, hopefully carry that through for the remainder of the year. So uh, that's all I got for you this week. Thanks, guys. See you around. Hello, and welcome to the UK. It's Tom here again, and I'm just going to give you a quick recap of what's going on over here. So. Uh, yeah, this week uh, we've got a lot of work going on in the character side of things. We've got Forrest Stefan over from the LA studio, who a lot of you will already know. He's the CG supervisor and um, he built a lot of the character pipeline and in, in how, um, how the character artist should, should follow a certain uh, way of working. And um, yeah, he's currently working with our team closely here to uh, really sort of train those guys up and uh, currently iterating on the McLaren character who's played by Gillian Anderson. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, really cool and, and coming along nicely. And then uh, we also have the script writers over from LA as well. We've got uh, John Schimmel, Dave Haddock and uh, Will Weisfaum. So these guys are really drilling into all the Squadron 42 uh, levels and, and reviewing with the design team to make sure everything uh, syncs up, matches up and, and looks and feels good. And then there's also some shoot planning ongoing for later in the year, so we expect it to do some pickups and shoot a few extra bits at some point and so that planning is is ongoing at the moment and uh, on the tech side uh, there's a lot of work going on in the engine there's um, the object container uh, code being uh, done at the moment by Stephen North and uh, this will be kind of the foundations to enabling us to um, handle a lot of things in the vast sort of large world spaces that we're, that we're dealing with and there was further talks on how we'll be handling flying capital ships, so lots of interesting stuff. Uh, there's lots and lots of work to be done still there, but uh, yeah, all the groundwork's being put in and all the systems are being laid up nicely. Um, in other news, uh, quite interestingly, you might want to check out the BBC, um, who did a piece on Chris Roberts while he was over here last week, so uh, see if you can take a look online and, and find out that article um, and recording they did whilst they were here. So. Yeah, lots going on and uh, still lots to come. Uh, nice speaking to you all. Uh, see you all in the verse. Hey everyone, Brian Chambers from Frankfurt. Uh, thanks for watching this week. Um, studio, uh, the office overview. We got a few new hires in. We got a new system designer that started with us. Great. Um, you'll probably hear from him in the future. 
Um, we also I believe we had another animator sign up, another senior cinematic animator, and in, in the process of others. So it's good to see growth and people interested in getting some talent to help us push this the way it needs to be. Um, on the engine side, um, guys are still uh, progressing on the procedural planet stuff and making improvements to that. Um, Finishing up some last-minute animation stuff on FPS so we can get that programmer moved on to a couple other things that I think you guys will be interested. AI still pushing along, covering ships, covering dudes, uh, and, and driving it the way they need to. There's a lot of parts and pieces that are there that are constantly moving. Um, I was in the UK last week driving, uh, drilling down on, on schedules. Um, a lot on cinematics, going through everything as far as localization and characters and so on. So it's good to hang out with those guys. Uh, this week brought in Todd Pappy, our design director. Uh, he can jump on design and, and talk you guys through what he's been playing with and him and the guys for the last week or so. So we're running up interdiction right now, which is basically pulling ships out of quantum drive um, and also not letting ships go into quantum drive if, if they're out of it. Uh, so then you start seeing some of the gameplay advantages that you can create with that, yeah. whether taking down pirates or pirates taking down you. Uh, then we're on the environment side or, or basically the level design side and systems design side, we're thinking about how with ships we have piping. So the concept of uh, Something creates power, something uses power, something creates heat, something takes away heat. Mm -hmm. uh, how are we going to use those in the environment and, and make sure that the environment sandbox feels just like the ship sandbox, yeah, which yeah. will also feel like... That the, way you get that player. consistency and the familiarity between Correct. The two. And we, we want to make sure the player doesn't have to learn a new language. And that, those are the main things that we're focusing on right now. Cool. Awesome. Again, short and sweet. Uh, thanks for all the fans. Uh, every morning I come in, I've been watching uh, people stream on Twitch, and it's been fun to see people with uh, the newest release that we have and kind of, uh, you know, the gameplay and the elements they're coming up with. It's cool and fun to watch. So, again, thanks to everybody, and see you next week. Please, please keep doing that, man. That is awesome. <laughs> There you go, get a little bit of a uh, Nelly Furtado in there. <laughs>
So when I think, when I think my, uh, my friend's constellation is here, it's actually here and not 50, you know, light years away. Exactly. Like, yeah. I was trying to think of a smaller distance, uh, line of distance in light years. I'm like, inches? That's what the process was going on in my head here. About light years is what I came up with. Uh, what is smaller than light years? What do we measure? Meters? We just measure in meters. It's meters. It's meters. All right, you're watching the breakdown of Disco Lando here. All right, so client servers. Now, we don't run those in a room in the back of Foundry. No. Where do we run our client servers from? So they're all uh, in the cloud on the Google Compute Engine. On Google Compute Engine. Yes. And that's a network that existed before us. You yes. know, it, it, they, they've had their own infrastructure going. What are some of the advantages of us using Google Compute instead of building our own server infrastructure? Um, well, if we have to build our own server, uh, server farms, then uh, obviously that's a, a big outlay on, uh, on hardware. Uh, we'll have to build server centers um, all around the world mm -hmm. to uh, serve all our backers. Um, and that's a massive cost. Google have already spent all that money, mm -hmm. um, so and they're prepared to, to rent out the hardware to us, so bonus. And uh, they've also got a, a, a really optimized back end, uh, backbone, uh, which gives us a very fast connection between the servers, so we can shuffle all that data about nice and quick. And I imagine there's some aspect of customer service we get from Google, it's, you know, service support, you know, when, when we're trying to figure out how to make everything work, we can. Yes, yeah, I believe they've been very helpful. You have a number of Google you can call, yeah. right? Besides the cost, is there a technical advantage of using Google? Because uh, the hardware's not ours and we can um, pay for what we use, we can mm -hmm. scale on demand. Okay. Um, so we can spin up more server instances as we need them, as uh, player demand increases, and then we can uh, shut them down when player demand decrease and everyone goes to bed. You know, most, most games don't run a live player environment during game development. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's always hard to figure out what your needs are going to be from, from one day to the next or from one week to the next. Yeah. I mean, we've had some weeks where we've got, where we've got lots and lots and lots of players, you know, no specific numbers or anything here. And then the next week, you know, that drops off as you know, Daredevil comes out on Netflix, they're watching that instead of playing around. So it, it fluctuates a lot, and using something like Google Compute allows us that flexibility. Yes. That's very cool. Um, now, senior network programmer, uh, what's your day-to-day -day like? Like, forget special projects or whatever. If you, if you came into work, you've checked your emails, you've, 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 you've looked at your JIRA tickets and seen what needs to be done, what, what's your day like as a senior network programmer? Well, we'll count the first protocol if, uh, if anything goes wrong with the builds. Um, so if any, uh, any bugs get reported by the backers mm -hmm. that look like they're related to the, the client or the server or the network in between them, then we'll have to investigate, try and set up some tests, maybe add some extra debugging. So the next patch that goes out, we've got some more information to work with. Um, but beyond that, we're trying to um, extend the networking layer to make it more efficient because um, what we started with uh, wasn't really designed for like an MMO type game mm -hmm. at the time of t the scale of game that we're trying to do with Star Citizen. So piecemeal, we're, we're adding bits onto that, chucking old bits away, replacing parts, and just making it go faster and easier to scale. Yeah, there's a, uh, I know a lot of folks have taken to calling our modifications to the engine Star Engine. Right. That's not an official name, by the way. It's just something a lot of the fans have started applying. It's, it's. I think it's neat, you know, because we're, we're, as development continues, we're, we, we, we get farther and farther away from what CryEngine originally was. Yeah. So, I, I like that a lot. Um, again, not an official name. <laughs> get, get the lawyers involved. Um, network programmer, senior network programmer. How much do you hate lag? Uh, a lot. It's it just. <laughs> Makes everything really, really hard. Yeah. It's, yeah. All right. Uh, so uh, before we wrap up, you're here in LA. Uh, we've we've got quite a few visitors today, or this week rather. And for the next two weeks, we've got Mark Skelton in there, uh, Tony Zerovex here. Uh, anybody else from the UK coming? Um, no, not this week. No. They just sent you. Yes. Okay. So uh, can you talk a little bit about what 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 you're what you're working on here this week? Um, yeah, so there's uh, an engineering roadmap being put together for what we're hoping to achieve for 2016. Um, so I'm here to, to help go over the, the network part of that, make sure we've got everything on the list that we want and that uh, it's a reasonable 
amount of work that we can actually achieve this year. Okay. Uh, last but not least, uh, I know we talked a little bit about where you, where you came from before. You've had, you've had quite a storied history yeah. in video games. Uh, we talked a little bit about some of your favorite games. Uh, is, there, is there one thing in particular besides Star Citizen that, that you're really proud of that you've worked on? I worked on FIFA for a while, and so uh -huh. probably that, um, probably because it's back home, it's a game that everybody recognizes, where some of the other games I've worked on, people have never heard of. I've, I've, I've never played it, but I had a neighbor who used to play it online religiously, right, and, yeah. and he, uh, he, seemed to very, he seemed to enjoy the online play of that very much, so, yeah. so I'm sure... I'm sure I, I, didn't, I wasn't an online programmer back then. Oh, no? No, I was what? a physics programmer back then. <laughs> Well then, never mind. I was gonna, I was gonna be his hero here, but all right. Well, uh, thanks for coming by. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> Back to you guys. We are smaller now. Shields at full strength. We're looking okay. We need to nose down a little bit. Let's have a look. Okay, we're in here. We're in here, um, we got a little bit of space at the front. No, no, wait! <gasps> Victory! Thanks guys, I hear Clive was here in the office for about six minutes before Jared uh, grabbed him to be in the interview, so uh, thank you for being a good sport. Uh, we, we really want to give the guys in the UK more, uh, more screen time, so expect to see more of them in the future. I love our guys in the UK. I was trying to find guides for some interviews and they all kind of conveniently <laughs> hide. <laughs> Uh, well, I'm trying to find them. Next up, the Foundry 42 audio team are back to show us a little of their tremendous work on the Crusader Mini PU. Check it out. For 2.0, we had lots of kind of linear, um, kind, of, kind of more linear elements for, for the game than we would have had normally, I suppose, for, for Crusader generally. Uh, and particularly Port Portal Star, I think it's the first one you start in, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so, how did you do you approach that? From because you, you were seen the sound designer on that, which you know, um, yeah. how did you um, approach it? It was kind of a uh, iterative process. It's because uh, we're working alongside the designers. Um, you know, they're building and restructuring as they go. So, uh, we're watching that and just figuring out how we're going to fill that space and um, you know what we can do is as sort of core moments in that space to give it its definition. So like we've got the, the big hologram area in the centre. So this is the uh, the main room of the Port Olasar station and this is the uh, huge hologram that's the central central element. Um, it's quite an impressive looking thing and uh, I started off with a general sort of hologram mm -hmm. buzzing tone to it but I wanted something a bit more um, sort of characterful for it. Um, I got the idea from the film uh, Ex Machina, the, the, uh, the robot in it had a brilliant sort of buzzy, birdy sound when she moved that I thought was quite interesting. And so it inspired me to build up these, uh, these little additional elements here that uh, sound like this. Lovely little just sort of yeah. lasery, birdy flybys. Uh -huh. uh, so all this really is, it's uh, a, a few different layers of buzzing tone, just like that, which is just very straightforward on its own, but uh, adding in some Doppler effect, some uh, some effects called the Enigma, which is a kind of a, a phaser yeah. effect. I've it always sounds loved. like who knows what it does. It's who an knows enigma. what it does? It's a phaser. It's not true. <laughs> kind of obvious. Uh, and uh, a filter called Volcano, and uh, add all that together, and we uh, get these lovely sort of delicate birdy futuristic sounds uh -huh. which uh, just gives it a lot of extra a lot of extra character so uh, yeah, as, as you said before as well we have the these uh, announcements uh, emanating from the central point of this room and then mm -hmm. there's there's other ones in the uh, what's my place now in the, the lobby area over here sure 
uh, and they they because they're they're talking about things you can do and things to do with the the, the game's fiction. It adds a huge amount to it, and they're on a a loop of about I think about twenty or so different announcements right. that, that that are relevant to the game's uh, the player's experience. Mm -hmm. uh, so as you walk through these different spaces, again we have that kind of uh, Star Trekky space station rumble to it underpinning everything but as you move through the different places there's uh, there's a different quality to it and like for example on the uh if we go upstairs oh no not that way um the upstairs has uh it's more gentle and there's there's like i said there's that sleepy uh day at the beach kind of quality to it where it's uh, slowly sort of fading in and out um i can actually i can Bring that up, you could see what what was going on. And those those little speaker icons we're seeing, essentially, the, that's where we put the, the sound. Yeah, like that, that's the, the, yeah, that's the. So, for example, let's see, we got um, here's a little uh, air conditioning vent. There's just a little extra burst of, of audio there. It's really it's it, it's a nice combination of big, open, um, ambient spaces mm. audio, and then you get these little spots of sound that just. Uh, they go a long way to adding the detail and because you pass by them quite quickly yeah, and stuff yeah. it really brings it all to life so here we go just once here this is on a little control panel mm. just as a little beep every few minutes uh, so we look at let's see got to do the vending machine oh yeah <laughs> so this is the uh, if I bring up the effects there uh -huh. so you can see I just uh, I made this this ambient uh, general sort of airy yeah. loop for the upstairs area, right. but then just to give it some interest, uh, I recorded myself moving the the EQ of it up and down, uh -huh. which gives it that that strange sound you get at the seaside of the air sort of catching yeah, the it catching the waves. Yeah. Um, but that that's oh, it's very subtle in the game. I mean, you'd have to stop and have a listen to it, but. Uh, uh, I was pretty happy with it. Gave it the kind of sleepy tone that I was looking for for that upstairs area. So I mean, it's it, you can easily just spend quite a lot of time in any given area, depending on how you play the game. So we tend exactly. to have to think of not just in terms of moment to moment, but yeah. in terms of well, if you you know if a player hangs around, you know what they go experience just to show that the whole environment is evolving, mm. evolving in some way. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Um, and that's again, that's a place where the uh, the well, fact that we have the the community and um, people playing the game and feeding back to us that's incredibly valuable because yeah. you can spend uh, a long time on an area people just aren't interested in and conversely you could you could do a very sort of a quick basic pass in an area that tends to be a big sort of social yeah, hub and yeah, very true. makes you want to go back and add some more interesting yeah. little easter eggs and things that can be just like you know a slight irony i suppose in that you, sometimes you have to spend quite a lot of time putting detail into areas where mm. there's not much going on because it's possible for the player to evaluate what what it's like yeah. just by going up to things and saying oh, that should be making a sound in my mind and yeah. why isn't it you know but in a in a very busy area you can actually create an impression of that relatively simply you know yeah uh, that's I mean that's why I, I came back and added the, the extra detail to this hologram just because uh, uh, I've, I've watched so many videos and there's a lot of people just using this as a little central space while yeah. they're figuring yeah. out where they're going to go and what they're going to do yeah uh, there's a nice little extra tone in this room. Uh, in the the actual gameplay, the uh, I guess it's a gravity generator. I'm not actually sure, but this yeah. great big strut outside is is moving very slowly in a very grand way. So while you obviously can't hear it outside, I thought it'd be nice to feel like it's somehow moving through the central core of the station. Mm -hmm. So it gives a nice sort of groaning, distant metal stress yeah, sound yeah. As, as you uh, as you watch it move. Right. Yeah, it's it's um, it's really it's there's a lot of toing and froing. Um, I think the, the, the sort of the first, I'd say the first third to the first half of the development process for a space like this, that's particularly important to make sure you're talking to the designers and the artists and uh, uh, everyone has ideas, I mean they're all creative people so they have things that they would love to hear so it's, it's usually, it's very you know, rewarding at getting them involved at that point. And uh, just because these, these levels are so uh, intricate and there's, there's often sort of hidden vents or, or uh, you know, rooms you have to access in a certain way that you can't just rely on you know, living um, in your little box not talking to people. You need to get out there and actually ask them about it. So um, working with the designers on, on this and the other, like the, the pirate station, uh, they immediately gave me their ideas for you know, this being very clean. This has almost got a sort of 
a shopping mall feel to it, that, that cleanliness mm. and, that, and uh, the pirate station should be hostile, should be sort of very staccato in its, in its feel. Um, and it's great, I mean, uh, I, could, I could look at the space, I could wander around it myself, but it's not until you talk to the designers and artists that you start to get a feel of what, what it is you should be selling. So that process is invaluable. Um, and uh, they don't mind the noodle machine. Yeah. They have to deal yeah. with it a lot. I don't know how many of those we actually had in this particular area. I obviously saw one a bit earlier, but um, <laughs> yeah. There's, uh, there's about six in, in this station. Yeah, you, you would know how many there were. <laughs> there we go, that's a noodle machine. Mm. There we go. Oh, happens with, yeah, there we go. Just on cue. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the... Uh, I took the, uh, the little theme tune that I wrote and um, I just added, uh, we've got an amazing program called Speakerphone that uh, um, you can use it to apply the effects of pretty much any space you can, you can conceive of. It, it has settings that can make it sound, sound like it's coming out the boot of a particular car or the cockpit of a certain helicopter. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a phenomenal piece of software. And uh, it's, I think most people in, in the Yeah, it's come very industry. handy, I suppose it's post-production yeah. and, and the game thing. And this is it's the, all about areas. This is the infamous... Well, that's about the kind of the idea, isn't it? Yeah. To be influenced by that, isn't it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I thought it was going to loop then. We don't need that. We don't. If you want to hear it for 10 hours, someone's put that together on YouTube. So, uh, <laughs> Did they really? <laughs> yeah, there's a 10 hour loop of it on YouTube. Of course. Cool. So thank you, whoever that was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, and so then there's other than that, there's just these uh, little points of interest here and there. We have uh, another speaker here emanating from a desk, and there's a little bit of gentle sort of music playing around because it's, it's kind of a lobby area. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much the core of it. It's just it's just a nice bed of sort of very soothing, rumbling, low-level ambience, sort of uh, overlaid with the. Uh, the constant tannoy, and the tannoys are very friendly, yeah. so it's, it's quite pleasant, not too jarring. Uh, there's never a, a situation where you can sit down, start it, and then finish it without there being gaps, just because, uh, like every other department, we're iterating and we're finding that things work and other things don't. So, And like Lee said, the space itself changed, areas opened up, uh, other areas just you know, changed as, as they try it out and people find that the, the space isn't working. So, Yeah, there's, um, a, there's a lot of revising that we just yeah. have to do really um, and imagine it wouldn't surprise if it changed again even though it's still out there already yeah so yeah that's how we design the audio for the space stations and uh, how we define the difference in their tone and their spaces um, hope you guys found that interesting thanks a lot I hear the sound guys really do great work you hear <laughs> it's always really nice when we receive fan gifts from everybody from all around the world and uh, there are some remaining ones here that we haven't actually eaten yet. So. Yes, a giver from Australia just sent a whole box of bizarre Australian treats, um, some of which we've saved here for posterity. Um, thank you very much. It, it, always, it means a lot to the whole team when this sort of thing arrives. Uh, it's also cool seeing food from around the world. Uh, we really appreciate that. And we can smell the Vegemite from all the way down the hallway, which Toast, toast has sequestered. Somehow Toast loves Vegemite because there's something wrong with him. Um, <laughs> he puts Vegemite on everything, on all mm. things that you probably shouldn't. And recently we also received a gift from longtime fan Kin Shadow, who we know is a tabletop gaming enthusiast. Yes, this is pretty cool. He sent us a uh, copy of Cards Against Humanity, um, everybody's favorite card game for terrible people, uh, with his own take on it, Van Duel Against Humanity, uh, with uh, Star Citizen themed cards and so on. We're looking forward to trying that out. So thank you very much, Kid Shadow. And now it's time for this week's MVP. Back in LA, envelope please. Oh envelope. my gosh. Sadly, really. Alexis is out sick today, so there's no oh. MVP envelope. Well, I was going to say we had this amazing envelope here in LA, because <laughs> in UK we didn't have one, but yeah. clearly we don't have one. 
We're saving you money by not <laughs> making envelopes every week. Well, this week's MVP is actually two people. Star Citizens third and Argon. Congratulations. Congratulations, guys. Uh, they created a plugin for the Rocap Power Grid app, which allows folks to remotely control their uh, aspects of their computer. Um, and the Star Citizen plugin allows you to use the, your uh, phone as a touchscreen uh, with Star Citizen. It's pretty right. cool. And I'm going to go over here to the shield screen. Now, here you've got dorsal, ventral, port, forward, aft, starboard, or balanced. Not to mention you can just click anywhere on the grid. Now, to see how this actually interacts, let's go ahead and move the shields to the right. Shields to port. You'll notice that um, it actually shifted over to port. Um, now, we can also go back into shields here and say starboard. Shields to starboard. And you can see that it moves the little indicator to the right. Say all that ten times backwards. <laughs> no, never. <laughs> Yay. And now, here's your art sneak peek. Be sure to tune in to Reverse the Verse tomorrow at 11 a.m. on Twitch. We'll be discussing that art sneak peek and what we had for lunch this week. <laughs> I've been eating all the Aussie treats. That's what I've been doing. And, uh, of course, thank you to all of our subscribers for making this show possible, as always. We will see you next week on, on Around, Around the Verse. The verse.